Hello and welcome. I'm Christina Johnson, president of The Ohio State University. This evening's event is the third in a series designed to realize Ohio State's motto, Education for Citizenship, in light of the January 6th attack on our nation's capital. Tonight, we're focusing on race and democracy in America. Let me begin by quoting a beautiful passage from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The vision of our founders was utopian and ascribing equal dignity to kings and humble farmers. But I've always wondered, why did the framers of our democracy leave out women, African-Americans, indigenous peoples, and others who are created equal? It has been the great struggle of our national history to recognize the rights of a democratic society apply to all Americans. And yes, we've made progress. However, more than half of a century since the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, we still witness corrosive racial injustice, which has resulted in an enormous privilege gap in home ownership, educational attainment, and health outcomes between black and white families. What can we do to fulfill the promise, the beautiful promise of our American democracy and leave our history of racism behind? This is not an easy question to answer. But fortunately tonight, we have a brilliant panel with us, representative of our talented scholarly community. who will try to answer it. Now, please allow me to introduce our moderator, Dr. Tina Pierce, senior lecturer in our John Glenn College of Public Affairs and the founder and CEO of WORTH, an educational consulting company that provides evidence-based trainings and programs to cultivate leadership and increase civic and increase civic engagement. She's a three-time graduate of Ohio State in which she received a BA, MA, and PhD. She was also a current member of the Columbus Board of Education. On tonight's panel, we also have Dr. Wendy Smooth, Associate Professor of Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies and Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the College of Arts and Sciences. We also then have Dr. Rachel Cleet, Professor of City and Regional Planning and Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs and College Administration in the College of Engineering. And finally, Dr. Winston Thompson, Associate Professor of, of Philosophy of Education in the College of Education and Human Ecology. And now I'll turn the program over to Dr. Pierce. President Johnson, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I would encourage everybody, if you would like to learn more information about our panelists, the books that they are working on, and um, any uh, future events that they will be speaking at, please go visit our website that, again, highlights tonight's uh, conversation. That is odi.osu.edu backslash education, citizenship, and events. Without further ado, then, I just want to get us right into this frank, engaging, and meaningful conversation about race. Our first conversation, well, our first question for the conversation um, relates to really um, some of the things that we have been seeing that are going on in our current uh, climate. So during the Obama presidency, there was discussion that America was becoming more of a post-racial nation. The topic has reemerged here recently, but in a different way. In a context in which during the Trump era, we've seen the polar opposite. So our first question of the night is, is America closer to becoming a post-racial nation? Because of the Trump years, why or why not? And I'll let any one of our panelists that wants to start off and take that question, go right ahead. And I'll give it a start. Um, so I think we're not um, a post-racial nation. And I think even under Obama, we were not a post-racial nation. I guess the, the question I have is what's the lived experience of people who are not white in the United States? And 
uh, it's very, it's much, the people I think were saying we were post-racial were not necessarily people from communities of color. It's not as easy as simply treating everyone the same, but really understanding that there are deep structures in society that still function, even if we want to give everybody similar opportunities. I, I think that's very well put, uh, Rachel, and I'll just allow me to sort of uh, continue on on that on that theme. I mean, um, the idea of a post-racial society is uh, perhaps attractive to some. Uh, because it suggests sort of a utopian vision for the future, right? I mean, so uh, at the beginning of uh, the conversation this evening, uh, President Johnson gave us these rather stirring words that sort of uh, pointed us towards uh, the promise uh, of, of America. And to some people, that promise might seem to suggest, uh, in fact, a, a society in which none of us are marked, right, by race, perhaps we're not marked by gender, uh, by class, and so forth. What I find really interesting about the, the sort of the idea or the move towards the post-racial society is that um, I don't often hear people talking about the difficult work required, right, to move towards the more utopian ideal, right? I mean, um, you know, when you have a promise, right, a promise is a commitment. Right, but that doesn't. It, it's not a sort of a a, a magical invocation, right? It's it's not. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it 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 requires hard work, and so you know, uh, to answer the question uh, that's been posed to us in this moment, you know, are we closer to a post-racial society? Um, you know, I think it's a very complex uh, 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 answer to give to say, well, in some ways, perhaps, and in some ways, not, right? Um, I'll just speak very briefly about the ways in which we might be moving closer. Uh, I think many of us in this country at this moment recognize that we've got some deep problems that we need to address. And perhaps uh, recognizing the problems that we need to address might move us towards finally rolling up our sleeves and doing some of this difficult work. So Rachel and Winston, you really are hard acts to follow um, in a conversation. And I want to say that I definitely do agree um, with several or the, the core sentiment that we are not anywhere close to a post-racial society. And what I would even put out there is that I'm not sure that I ever am thriving to become necessarily a, a post-racial society. Because what a post-racial society also requires us to do is to participate in an ahistorical reality. That's right. Meaning that we are not embodying the fullness right. of our history and the fullness of how we have come to sit in this moment of a long process of becoming we the people, right? So it's ahistorical. The other, and it's also um, a part of a broader kind of politics of erasure. Um, and to Winston's point, yeah. that politics of erasure makes it really easy for us to skip several steps as opposed to going through the evolutionary process of deep change. The last thing I'll say about this particular moment um, in the Trump era, that I think is profoundly engaging. And I am really interested in where we go around this moment of refining what whiteness means as a racial category. What I mean by that is that when we've often talked about a post-racial society, what we are invoking are minoritized ethnicities and racial groups. Um, we know that in the shifting demographics of the nation, uh, from a numerical standpoint, we're shifting demographically in such a way that the minoritized groups are not the numerical minority. And we've seen this now in about 102 counties across the country where we can mark that they are officially majority non-white. And we have to keep that as a part of our conversation, this kind of shifting demographic. But I'm also, un, I'm, I'm struck by a way in which we will have to define what we mean by whiteness. That's both a theoretical conversation that scholars, our colleagues have been engaged in, in terms of critical whiteness studies. But the events of January 6th 
And I would say where we have been across the last spring and into this current moment are telling us that we as citizens will have to have a critical conversation on what are the contours of whiteness, what does it mean to be white, and what kind of white, individual white citizens must decide what kind of white will I be in this America? Can I, can I respond? Can I just react to Wendy's? Um, I really appreciate what you're saying because I think that is where we're going. And I think um, for a lot of white Americans, um, and I guess I am one, I, I have a, I, it's, it's very hard, right? Because you, while people who are recognized minorities have to almost all the times think about their identity, right? Folks who are in the, who are in the majority or in the whiteness camp um, or who pass for white, maybe, I don't know, don't have to think about that in the same way. And this is more from a, um, not from as much a scholarly perspective, but a experience of living in, in, in the world and having to come to grips with, with whether I'm white or not, frankly, right? Because I'm Jewish and I never thought of myself as white until I took a, a what is it? Took a, a white fragility seminar. And mm -hmm. that, inter I didn't, the inter intersectionality of that identity and the privilege it gives me as a white person, even though I also understand a lot of what it means to be a minority, right? So I, I think for people who are in my shoes, who, as you know, I am uh, someone who does research on integration and segregated communities, this conversation, learning how we have this conversation in a way that we can actually engage with what the feelings that it brings up for both sides. And the problem is one side has been having this conversation for a very long time. And the other side is like, oh, you've been having a conversation? Oh, I have to learn this conversation? Oh, okay, right? So I think it's a, uh, we are, I think one of the things, uh, Dr. Thompson, one of the things I think is so interesting is about talking about this point and are we getting closer? And I, and I, and I like that, uh, Dr. Smith, you're talking about, do we want to? Yeah. And that's kind of my, my feeling is, I think we, I would like, it cl like to get closer where we understand that people do have different identities, that everybody has that, right? Rather than there being a, and, and that might help us to move closer, as you say, Dr. Thompson, I don't know. Thank, thank you so yeah. much. And, and, and I'm loving this conversation because in this moment, what I hear you all saying is that um, while the Obama presidency, we moved into this moment where we were um, captivated and caught up in this idea that race does not matter, right? Um, you all are saying that even that conversation alone, you're erasing the importance of race, you're erasing the socio-historical process by which the lived experience of people is impacted by their racial identity. And so I, I appreciate you all providing um, that, that additional context for individuals to understand just in that conversation what pro racial means, what it comes with, what it begins to exclude, and how it begins to make people feel, and their identity. Um, and I love the fact that you all, you know, are, are, are very upfront in terms of we have to be able to have this conversation and center race and center race in the conversation. And so the next question then is going to push the needle a little bit further with this. How might the events of January 6th become the beginning of a new era of political violence? And what role did white identity politics play into what happened? I'm happy to say a few words to get us started. I mean, uh, you know, one thing that we might uh, hold in mind as we reflect on the uh, truly troubling uh, events of the, the, the 6th of January is, you know, uh, what's our response going to be moving forward? 
right? Uh, what's happened has happened. It can't be undone. Uh, there's a question now about how we are going to respond uh, to what has happened. Uh, and the response that we have will sort of set a standard uh, for what we expect uh, for the future, right? Or what we can anticipate for the future. So, uh, you know, sort of to more directly answer your question, um, you know, uh, if we want this to be a moment uh, that is sort of a, a call to, uh, to waking up, to recognizing, as I uh, suggested earlier, Earlier, um, you know, recognizing that there is a, a, a pervasive and ongoing, abiding uh, set of problems in this country that need to be addressed, um, we, we've got to mark this moment, uh, that time, that those those set of events, uh, as um, you know, um, uh, against what it is we, uh, uh, the people, uh, expect of ourselves and of one another. Uh, to the second part of your very good question here about. Um, you know, uh, white identity politics. I mean, I think that, you know, the uh, events of the sixth, I mean, when you look at the uh, the video and the images and you uh, see that uh, people proclaiming themselves patriots are uh, holding Confederate flags uh, uh, in the air as they're uh, storming the Capitol. I mean, that does suggest to me that there's something of, uh, and I'm gonna return to uh, 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 the good uh, uh, Dr. Smooth's uh, invocation of historical context, right? It, it suggests to me something of a revision uh, revisionist approach, if you will, uh, to history, right? Um, an attempt to, and we saw this in the sort of the, the last days of the Trump administration with the 1776 commission, uh, which was uh, in some um, uh, accounts, a response to the New York Times' uh, 1619 uh, uh, project, right? We see uh, this uh, a real attempt to try to center uh, whiteness to center a narrative about the history of this country uh, that presents uh, heroes and villains uh, in a story and a struggle that sets a context for how we understand our present moment, right? And so, you know, as a, a philosopher, as someone who uh, tries to understand uh, education, particularly uh, from that perspective and from that discipline of philosophy, uh, I think, you know, uh, the, the, the way in which we contextualize uh, the problems or the questions that we're seeking mm -hmm. to address uh, really uh, uh, prevents or enables uh, certain outcomes, certain answers, and certain possibilities. I think there's no, um, it's no mistake or it's no uh, coincidence that uh, a moment of of, of, of discomfort might seem to someone to be a disadvantage if they've got uh, one sort of uh, historical narrative in mind and a moment in which someone feels uncomfortable might seem to them to be a moment of uh, a moment that is unjust uh, if they've got uh, uh, you know that that um, sort of altered historical narrative in mind uh, so I think we've really got to uh, pay attention to uh, the sort of the background narratives that are informing a lot of the discussion debate, and in some cases, physical violence uh, that's occurring at this moment in our democracy. You know, thank you so much for, I love, um, I could listen to you for forever. And I was getting lost in all the ways that I know post pandemic, we have to have a lot of coffee together. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. But, you know, one of the things, and I wanna, I think we do have to sit in the kind of darkness of the 6th of January to fully appreciate um, a way forward. And I hate that kind of uncomfortableness of sitting with that darkness. Um, and I understand the really quick visceral reaction that we as Americans have um, to rebuking that that's not us, you know. Um, on the 6th, when then President elect Biden went to the podium um, to calm the nation and to call upon then President Trump to uh, rebuke the actions um, of the protesters and restore some calm. Biden did what I thought was an incredible mischaracterization. Mm -hmm. And he started by saying, let me be very clear, the scenes of chaos at the Capitol do not reflect the true America. This is not who we are. And it was a real visceral deep disdain um, for the moment. But I was a little disappointed in that comment because I saw it as perpetuating a kind of fictive representation of who we are as America. And I kept going back to, you know, the popular television show, This Is Us, right? Um, and I said it over and over again to myself, this is us, this is us. 
But what we have actually um, talked about around the world, right, with all in question, our identity as America, a beacon of democracy, a citadel of liberty, right, was all on view as fractured and fragile and compromised in very deep ways. So I understand the impulse to correct that because we were challenged around our claim of American exceptionalism. But the difficulty in that kind of rebuking, right, is really that we miss an opportunity to appreciate our actual selves. So the political violence that we saw on January the 6th this was not a beginning of a political moment. Right. We are in perhaps <clears throat> the middle and ongoing. <clears throat> Our historians will tell us exactly where this is located in the kind of arc of history. But what we have known is that particularly for minoritized groups, and this goes back to Rachel's earlier comments about when we pay attention and who is impacted by um, the political climate. For minoritized groups, we have been Lonnie Guineer's proverbial uh, canaries in the mine, right? And we know that the canary goes into the mine to test the level of toxicity in the, you know. And what we've long argued is that minoritized groups in the US have always experienced um, the toxicity of the nation, right, Front, as a full, full frontal experience. And I'll give us just a really quick couple of examples. And pardon me, Buckeye Nation, for invoking the, the state up north. But Governor Gretchen Whitmer's uh, kidnapping plot in Michigan, right, was, we're learning now, was practiced and rehearsed as a broader storming of the Capitol. And the actual kidnapping of the governor was going to be the clear ultimate prize. And it is not lost in this conversation that Governor Whitmer is a woman governor and one of the few women governors we have serving um, in the nation. And I also don't want this to be a discussion that is so far from us. There were Ohioans, right, who are under investigation for being a part of that uh, plotted plot in kidnapping. The other thing that is, is even closer to home, because I wanna underscore the kind of commonality of this is us around political violence. We have even in the state of Ohio enacted a culture of political violence against our public servants. Yes, we have. Right? So if we remember in the early days of the pandemic, Dr. Amy Acton received death threats as she attempted to guide us through the early days of the pandemic. And we also saw not only death threats, but we saw protesters willing to go to her family's home and protest on the lawn of her home. The political violence piece, this is a continuation of us. What's different about the six, and I wanna link this also to the George Floyd killing. The six, alongside the George Floyd killing, offered us a moment in which we were forced to collectively witness America's political violence. And in that collective witnessing, there's no denial that it happened. There's no denial that Americans were involved. There's no denial, right, um, around the actual, um, public display of who we are. And that's actually the piece that is most encouraging to me is that we collectively witnessed it, which means that we must collectively claim it. Now, I wanna quickly say um, a couple of words, maybe we can get into a conversation around this. January 6th was about the rejection of voter participation and a re direct rejection of an expanded electorate in critical battleground states. On the one hand, we call them battleground states, but these are also states in which we have high minority political participation. 
And it is by no accident that that mobilized political action, largely at the hands of African-American and Latinas across those states to turn out new voters. We talk a lot about Stacey Abrams, but I'm not a, a cult of charismatic person, right? That there are a ton of women whose stories that we are beginning to tell who have since 2007 been organized and mobilized around voter participation. And they were successful in expanding the electorate in ways that we had not seen in recent years. January 6th was a direct rebuke of the expansion of democratic participation. And until we deal with and reckon with the um, denial of access to democracy, we would have missed the complete story of this moment. And I hope that we will be better than that, than to miss the story. No, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clay. Before you respond, I just were at that midpoint. So I want to thank everyone for attending tonight. I want to remind people that this is a conversation, as Dr. Smoot just indicated. Please place your questions. If you have questions in the question and answer box, our Q&A box, it's right at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So again, we want this to be a conversation. If you have a question, please place it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Dr. Clay, take it away. No, I, I wanted, I'm, I'm, this is so fascinating for me to listen to you. So I'm, because I'm not a philosopher, I'm not a political scientist. And I love, I, I love this, the, the, the pointing out that the, that the states in question are those that heavily, motiv, mo, heavily uh, mobilized that, um, communities of color to vote. Mm -hmm. that, that is something that um, I think that the, was that it was the capital there was a policeman who was in charge, I think what state it was, but he, he basically stepped down, he apologized the cap because he didn't realize that that was what was going on mm. um, because it's opaque to particular audiences. The thing that I wanna, I, I, see, I see what happened January 6th as um, an expression of anger that has been going on for a very long time. And what fascinates me about it, in addition to the voter suppression piece of it is the partnership between people who are very wealthy and people who are not wealthy in carrying out that day. There's a, we, we've had a stream of economic change in the United States for the past 30, 40 years where our economy has changed, which means that the white folks who used to work in factories and be represented by unions. There are, if there are fewer factories, we have, the, the, we have weakened the unions, right? And some of them, and in, we're seeing in rural places, weakening economies. Uh, we're seeing fewer jobs that actually pay people enough to live on um, a living wage. And with that change, the folks who've usually been able to say, you know, I provide for my family. I do this. May have people they know who've been struck by the opioid crisis as well, mm -hmm. right? So there's, there's a whole lot of pain in part of our country. And what I find problematic about what Biden said is that he basically said that didn't exist mm -hmm. by saying that this isn't us because there are people who are really, really angry. And the things they're angry about actually don't just affect them, but they do, but they do feed that division, th those two worlds that we see in the United States. The world that is listening to uh, voter suppression as if it is the right thing to do. And the folks who are saying, this is not us, right? And so the two sides, we need to start listening to each other without getting mad. And so the, the violence piece of it is for me, we're getting it, they're getting attention. They're saying we have power. I'm so angry, I want power. But when they get the power, they didn't know what to do with it, right? Like they, they, they so, the, so it purely was an expression of anger. Um, and so what it leaves me with is this kind of what I, I, I do anticipate that we will see more violence and we will have more domestic terrorism. 
unless we start really paying attention to those economic changes and the changes that make it hard for people to support themselves, which don't only affect low and middle class white folks, but also people of color, except you guys were the canary in the coal mine, right? <laughs> As you said, and now this, this is, and so the other folks are now getting mad. So I totally agree with what you say, Wendy. No, thank you. Thank you for that. And, and for pointing out the multi-layeredness, uh, the, the multi-dimensionality of how race can then affect the economic positioning of individuals, yeah. right? And how our in inability to have a very frank and open, honest conversation about the legacy of race, the very real um, experience and reality that individuals still face related to race has brought us to this point where we can no longer deny it. This, this is us and we have to have the conversation around it and deal with it. Now, one of the interesting things when, when we embrace that fact that this is us is that the response for January 6th was very different from the response that we saw related to the insurgency and the protests that was happening in June and July. So there were protests against police brutality and for racial justice that suggested a yearning among mostly liberal Americans of all racial backgrounds for uh, a different kind of America, America that understood we need to move towards racial justice. We need to deal with the racial inequities that exist in our communities and within our society. And an America where there are respirations, where the police uh, you know, are harshly and perhaps even defunded, um, where left wing po uh, politicians like the AOC are major influential figures. To what extent do you think that scares conservatives and how does that play into where we are now as a country? Fear has been um, a part of American politics since its inception, right? Um, in terms of, uh, you know, to Rachel's earlier point, what I saw in the protesters was a great deal of fear. Um, and this is a kind of a, a reaction to a fear of uncertainty and a reaction to um, a claimed or a personally understood entitlement that was no more. Um, and so there's a lot of fear um, around this idea that you have to, to share that the pie has to be constituted a little differently. Um, but I think, Tina, to your point around the complexity of this conversation, even among those on the left, I don't think that we see a kind of um, consensus, right, um, around the strategies, the language. So the idea of defund the police, um, you know, uh, Representative Clyburn of South Carolina has come out um, in a very kind of heated exchange around the ways in which the phrase defund the police um, has kind of galvanized and, and, and stirred up not only fear among those who are more conservative, but I think a fear among some more traditional uh, partisan liberal Democrats. Um, and we've got to, again, have some conversations that really help us to truly um, deal with that level of fear. And what I will say about that example of defund the police we have got to move away from understanding society, the world, the historical moment, the economy, and 140 characters or less. Yeah. Because we're doing a disservice, right? Defund the police has a huge history definition. It is, you know, when we get into the conversation and you read past the top line and you read three lines in, we start to see a call for a shift in funding away from a militarized state to a caring based state, which calls for greater attention to mental health workers inside of the police force, a move away from um, the kinds of um, 
militarize uh, school resource officers to social workers in our schools. So defund the police is one of those 140 character grab lines and we as a country have moved away from reading and critical exchange. So as a university person, as an academic, as a scholar, I'm begging us to read. I'm begging us to go deeper. I see our institution education as being a part of great possibility in teaching us to be critical consumers um, of, of communication, critical consumers, and to ask a demand that we go past 140 characters in our conversation. And that's the only way that I see us, us going forward. Um, because some of those things in that defund the police movement conservatives and liberals alike can agree on. Yeah. So, so Wendy, I, I'm smiling because that's one of our questions that came in <laughs> through our Q&A is, is how does social media play into this? And so that, that 140 characters, you know, Rachel Winston, how, how do you feel? What are your thoughts on this question? And yes, how does social media play into it? So I, this is, a, again, an, um, I, I have a very good friend I grew up with. Uh, in a small town in Massachusetts. And I check her Facebook page every so often because she lives out in Oregon on a farm. She went through the army. She's married to a Fudo veteran. And she, last thing I read was that she was, um, follow me on, what was that power? I can't even remember. I just lost the name of it. The, the liberal, the liberal, sorry, the conservative media that was banned the by- Parlor, thank you. Follow me on Parlor was the last thing I saw on her site, and um, so the we do things much too quickly, right? We, we information flows very fast. We react very fast. There's no time to sit back and say, "Wow, do I really believe that?" Or why is my friend who I grew up with doing this? How can she possibly be, uh, be doing that? So the, for me, the, the social media is, yes, it's short, but it's also this, this, all of our worst tendencies and how we deal with controversy are highlighted by social media. Hmm. Anyway, that's you know, because we do things, we, we like things, and they may be about people who aren't like us, and someone sees that. And so you've just created another division in society by doing that publicly, right? I think that's a, I think that's a fantastic point. If 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 I if I can just sort of uh, yeah. chime in there uh, on that on that on that nice sure. nice image of uh, you know liking something, right? I mean, so uh, on social media, uh, the world is simple, right? Uh, you, you like it or you don't, right? It's uh, it's a thumbs right. up or a thumbs down, right? Uh, the real world is far more complex, and I think uh, as I'm hearing both of you or all of us here in in, in concert. Uh, in unison saying, you know, democracy requires of us uh, that we move beyond that sort of binary us, them, right? right. Moving towards us, we, right? And so uh, it's it's the case that, you know, uh, again, I, I want to return us to, as uh, Dr. Smooth was suggesting earlier, uh, you know, the mission of our, of our institution, right? As an educational institution with a model that invokes uh, education for citizenship, you know, how can we begin thinking about, um, you know, uh, the type of education that uh, will create the types of citizens that are going to be able to uh, interact with one another in ways that sort of uh, do some justice to the very uh, uh, high ideals of democracy. You know, uh, it's the case that, again, thinking in binary terms, uh, we sometimes uh, might think of ourselves as uh, sort of either being or not being in a democracy, but we don't recognize that there's sort of, you know, gradients, uh, uh, you know, there are degrees of democracy, right? There's higher quality democratic engagement possible uh, if we move away from uh, just this sort of uh, surface level in interaction with one another. I mean, on, on the one hand, I'm, I'm inclined to uh, certainly agree with what we're saying here that, um, you know, democracy 
it seems, democracy is increased uh, or the quality of our democracy is increased when a greater number of people are uh, better informed uh, uh, and more knowledgeable about the world around them, certainly, right? Uh, as we were talking earlier about fear and how fear might motivate, right? Uh, fear of the unknown might motivate, right? So democracy is, is, is increased when a greater number of people have uh, access to, uh, 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 to, to, to knowledge. But I think it's also the case that democracy and the quality of our democracy increases when a greater number of people, right, contribute to what counts as knowledge, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, if it's the case that, uh, uh, you know, an institution like ours uh, can begin to uh, uh, create, that's the other sort of uh, side of this uh, uh, beautiful uh, institution. On the one hand, it's educational, but it's also about the creation of knowledge. If we are creating knowledge that's responsive to the lived experiences of persons in the world, right? We're inviting people to reflect upon their experiences, making sense of themselves uh, one another and uh, the moment in which they find themselves and the ways in which we might continue to interact uh, and communicate with one another as that's the core, uh, if you will, of democracy, right? Communication, mm -hmm. information, education. So, so you guys, uh, our, our Q&A box is, is, is going now. You have the conversation moving because you're engaged in this binary conversation, this idea that uh, slavery is not dead, that racism still plays a role in those economic structures, that social yes. media even makes it more complex. How do we begin to deal with these gaps between theory of how our democracy should and is supposed to work and how it's truly practiced, the reality that we live, the differences that we see and how people of color and African-Americans and white people are uh, affected by the legacy uh, of race in our country. Can I just say something very quickly? I know I was just speaking and that feels untoward to, to, back, to have back to back here, but I'll just say something very quickly and I know others want to chime in. You know, one thing that I think is, is helpful here, especially as we think about the fact that we are a diverse nation, um, it can often feel, I think, to some people that, uh, you know, the framing of, of certain questions or the, 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 um, the move towards uh, solutions, um, again, sort of uh, is, a, is an act of pointing a finger, right? This is your fault, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, when we're calling for for justice, we're saying you're uh, the wrongdoer. And so I think one thing that could be helpful or could be handy to sort of uh, uh, move us towards uh, you know, the difficult work ahead, uh, sort of, of binding uh, theory to practice in some good ways is to um, uh, be quite clear and move away from language that prioritizes, not that any of us do this, uh, but I think this is the way that people sometimes might perceive some of the mm -hmm. uh, 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 engagement that we're talking about, that moves away from uh, um, sort of uh, suggesting that someone is uh, at fault uh, in a particular moment, right? Perhaps we care, uh, uh, you know, less about who's at fault and more about who's responsible, right? Because that responsibility is a shared That's responsibility, right? right? Uh, we as citizens uh, need to recognize that the problems that we have in this country aren't problems for one community, for another community, uh, problems that are separate from us, distant from us, but these are our problems, right? These are problems that, you know, even if they don't affect me as immediately as they affect someone else, right? These are our problems. We have a shared responsibility for addressing these problems. And perhaps with that approach to thinking of ourselves as citizens, individuals who recognize a shared responsibility to address problems that are affecting uh, members of this, of this uh, larger community, we might move towards some greater, um, uh, greater cooperation in the service of democratic aims. I, I Dr. Was, Thompson, go ahead, I love go ahead. that. Make I appreciate it's turn. Go ahead. <laughs> you, you took us beyond this idea of this bipartisanship because you said put that to the side and let's look at it from a, a, a human perspective. Yep. We're all humans and let's think about us as community. Yes, I love it. You know, one of the things that I think is really um, insightful about this moment, right, as we are kind of moving past and moving through um, how we respond to the January 6th um, event. One of the critical and key ways that we have been able to identify those who led the surge, right. those who participated heavily, who took home memorabilia from their activities is through their friends and their family members holding them accountable yeah. and saying, that is not what I want to be a part of. Those do not reflect my ideals around mm -hmm. democratic practice 
and around democratic expression. That encourages me a lot, yeah. right? Um, because what it says to me is that we are willing to hold those in our communities accountable. And in this particular moment, I go back to my earlier point that this is a moment in which there is a huge need for critical whiteness engagement. Yeah. Because that question of what kind of white do I want to be, right, is at the center. Do I want to be associated, right, because we do broad associations, right, as to Rachel's earlier point. We don't differentiate between, no, 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 but I'm this, right? We have to be able to perform that we are a different or that you are a different type of white. And that is going to come through and be refined in conversations among white people, right? Mm -hmm. To talk about who is it that I want to be. And when you identify those who are operating as outside the parameters of what constitutes how you'd like to perform whiteness, you have to call it out. Yes. And I don't mean call it out in the sense of the kind of um, internet slam you down, but, you know, but we're going to root it out. We're going to kind of talk about it and we're going to figure out that we're not about that kind. And it's going to be really different from simply saying, oh, well, I didn't go, I didn't go to the Capitol. That's it's going right. to be important to say, I didn't go to the Capitol, but I know three people who did. And here they are, right. because this does not represent our performance of democratic engagement. So can, can I just ask a question? That, so what I've been thinking about as you've both been speaking has been about how change happens in a democracy. Mm. So we know that we're in a huge, we're in a, as you, as you mentioned earlier, we're in a time of extraordinary demographic change. We're in a time of economic change, increasing inequality. Um, and we're in a time where those things matter for who's maybe on top and who isn't, right? And that's making a lot of people very nervous and they're acting out, right? Okay. so. What the folks who went on January 6th don't differentiate between is people in the civil rights movement and what they did. Mm. They do not do that. Mm. They think what they did is protecting their rights, which I know, you know, so, so this problem of how do we engage together, I think is huge because there is such a mismatch in terms of the priorities we have as citizens, really. Um, and, and so I, I, I go back to, um, can change happen from inside the organization? So if we defund the police, can the police reform themselves? And defunding the police says, no, we, they can't actually is what that says, right? Um, although you, as you say, uh, Wendy, there's a, there is a deeper message there. Um, so we have to reform from the outside. Are we gonna, so the Black Lives Matters folks who were treated poorly compared to the folks who uh, stormed the White House on the 6th, um, these are two groups that actually need to talk to each other. And I, so how do you do that? I, I would love, cause you're talking um, Winston about conversation and democracy, but we are so vilifying each other that we can't do that. Well, so tell me I what that path say, looks like. Can I, I just add a little bit to that question? Can I just add a little bit to that question? Because um, again, we're in a university setting. You know, you all are, are charged to educate and advance uh, our democracy. And so as you answer this question, also right. think about it from a classroom perspective. How can we have these conversations in our classes? How can we get our students to, again, go home and challenge the three people that they know that were there? Right, and say, this is not what we're about. How, yeah. how, do, you, how do you have that conversation as well? Yeah, so I, I think this is a fantastic question. You know, uh, thinking about, again, as I alluded to in perhaps my first uh, comment this evening in our, in our very nice conversation here, you know, it's, it's, um, there's difficult work ahead, right? <laughs> no, no one, is, no one is, right. uh, uh, is, is suggesting that it's gonna be easy, but uh, I think some of the characteristics of that difficult work include uh, the difficult process of, on the one hand, wishing to be respectful of reasonable differences. And I wanna be clear here, reasonable differences <laughs> I know. Uh, 
you know, uh, our, uh, you know, differences that we have about matters uh, about which the truth is sort of um, indeterminate, or uh, we recognize that uh, there could be, you know, different values sort of motivating uh, particular positions that people hold, and that these are reasonable, and, and that's part of the difficulty of living with other that's people great. in a diverse society, right? But I think we need to separate that from uh, the type of you know uh, work that needs to be done that 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 was uh, referenced earlier of calling out right bad actors right who are engaged in bad practices. So you know what might we think of as a standard here? Well, one standard could be you know um, we're not going to tolerate views that are premised on the erasure of other of other people. Right? We're not going to sort of respect uh, uh, you know someone's right. To trample over the rights of others. I mean, this is sort of, you know, basic uh, sort of, you know, to a political scientist, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, this is 101, right? Uh, right. We're, we're, we're uh, in a society. But it seems that that's where we are in this moment because of some of the informational and communicational uh, and educational shortcomings uh, that are occurring in our society at this moment that cause people to think that the views that they hold uh, the opinions that they hold uh, right. deserve equal standing to the facts that other people present that's them. That's right. right. That's exactly so, so right. That's one of the ways in yeah. which uh, the educational institution plays a very crucial role in maintaining the sanctity and the strength of this democracy. Right. If you've got someone in the classroom with you who's advancing a view that's not supported by evidence, right? Well, that's an easy one, right? We point out why the view is not supported. Uh, we, we walk them through, you know, the standards for justifying, uh, justificatory standards for the views that they hold such that they might be able then to hold views in the future with greater uh, fidelity, right? They can sort of, um, uh, they can be confident that their uh, uh, beliefs are in fact uh, informed by the facts of the world around them. And I think at this moment in the society that we, that we find ourselves in, um, uh, that very basic standard- That's not there. Uh, has just been eroded. Yeah. No, we have no we have no facts there. The facts have been are disagreed upon, which is yeah. horrifying. Well, we disagree okay. about the facts and we disagree about the standards for what counts as a fact. Right. We disagree about that's how right. we get to. Right. And so and so that's the work, I think, um, that a, a, an institution like our great institution here at, at OSU uh, needs to be engaged in uh, for the good of, you know, uh, certainly the state of Ohio, but more broadly for the good of this uh, experiment that is the United States. And I think that's important to note as well. This is an experiment yeah. bringing together uh, a, a, a landmass of this size and uh, different cultures, different populations. Uh, we are a land of immigrants. We are a land of, of difference and diversity. Um, and as we think about the ideal that uh, President Johnson mentioned at the beginning of uh, our hour together, um, I think it's really important that we come to agree upon some standards for the discourse, because the disagreements are certainly going to be there. That's the nature of democracy. But we can have a higher quality democracy if we're able to communicate with one another across those differences, maintaining those differences in certain moments, but mm -hmm. also also recognizing that there are some standards uh, that we uh, that we have to endorse, such that we call certain people out as bad actors in in specific moments. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Yeah, I just want to place a little fine point, real quick, on that. Um, that is exactly. I mean, yes, that is exactly what we should do in our classroom spaces, and I am so hopeful that my colleagues across the university are pushing that past their own fears, right? To model um, and take up these difficult conversations in their classroom spaces. But even more than that, one of the things are spaces of learning that I think we are um, have to be open to and have to think really critically through in this moment. It's not only how we teach our students how to do that, and the safety of the classroom space, but we have got to figure out how to help them translate that learning, that classroom practice yeah. into everyday conversation. That's, right. That's actually Because true. when they go out across the 88 counties of Ohio and they go around the world as Buckeye alums do, they have to be ready to have the conversation in an applied space. Right, where we don't have the instructor guiding and we haven't set up the syllabi with 10 pages of rules. My syllabus is crazy, <laughs> it's like 10 pages, right? Rules of engagement. 
But in the open space of the everyday world, we've got to make sure that they can do that kind of translation so they can go to the Thanksgiving table and hold their own in a conversation and yeah. not a fight. Right. So the, but, but what I'm concerned about is that we, we would like for people to be swayed by facts and reason and logic. And the folks who stormed the Capitol are thinking with emotion and making up stuff. So there's a lack of empathy on their part for our side or for not for our, for the side, it is my side. I care about diversity and I care about inclusion. What am I saying? But the, this, this problem of empathy will, if we are not empathetic, we don't create relationships with people who disagree with us, we cannot have these conversations. So in order to do the things you wanna do, we need to learn how to talk to other people and make relationships and not social media, right? Can I just very briefly, I know you've got, you, we're gonna- We're, we're, we're like so excited here, you know? <laughs> very quickly say, yeah. the, the one, one thing here uh, is that um, I think that there is a role for emotion. There's a good role for emotion. And I think that you're, you're, you're pointing to it because the ties that bond us are often effective ties, right? Uh, emotion, right. right, matters, right? So I, I you know, it, I think, you know, on some level, it might seem as though uh, what I said earlier might move us towards being, you know, strictly rational as though we're gonna be robots or something. But I think it's, a, it's, it's important to note that values, emotions matter, right? And just as there are bad arguments that move us towards poor conclusions, there can yep. be, uh, uh, emotions that move us in the wrong direction. And so I think the difficult work is figuring right. out, right, how we can educate people's uh, uh, thoughts, how we can educate them re relative to their values, and also educate their sort of emotional being in relationship to others. I, that's all I'll say about that. There's a lot there, but um, thanks so much. But, but and, and that's the beauty of uh, today's <laughs> conversation is that we want to keep this conversation going. So we definitely want to thank everyone for attending, for participating, for putting your questions in that uh, question and answer box. We challenge you and we charge you to continue this conversation yes. in which race is centered, but we have a conversation in which we acknowledge everyone's identities. We acknowledge the emotions. We acknowledge the lived experience of individuals to move us towards actions and behaviors that create a higher quality, purposeful democracy. And here at The Ohio State University, we have a number of programs, a number of colleges that, again, you can connect to to continue that conversation and do the much needed work that needs to be done. Please visit the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, the Colleges of Arts and Science, Engineering, Public Affairs for upcoming courses, um, for programs and events such as today's Education for Citizenship, which are university-wide conversations uh, around frank, meaningful topics, discussions that go across our many communities. We also encourage you to visit the Michael Drake Institute for Teaching and Learning for teaching resources on inclusive teaching, teaching for racial justice. And we definitely encourage you um, to participate in our future session for Education for Citizenship on February 4th from 6 to 7, Navigating the Post-Truth World. We encourage everyone to tune in for, again, another engaging conversation. Thank you all so much for attending tonight.